Morning, everybody. It is the drive to school coming at you with another summer school edition. Uh, back with me today is uh, David Zills, who is uh, not only an engineer by trade, but he's an apologist. Uh, he, he's somebody who, who, well, wrestles with the faith. And that's, that's an important thing in a world where... I don't think it's necessarily brand new that it's it's easy to take it for granted, but I think it's easier to take for granted that there's some stuff to struggle with here. Uh, how are you doing today, David? Uh, I'm doing well. Yes. Uh, nice that the summer weather has finally hit where I live. So uh, I'm enjoying not being cold all the time. Yeah, the Midwest was a little late to the game, but uh, we made it. That's all right. We're representing. Um, yeah. I kind of... Uh, hinted at it to start with, but it's, it's hard to be a Christian growing up these days. Um, especially as you start to, to sort of leave the nest a little bit. Uh, we were kind of talking about this before we started recording. Um, and you mentioned, and, and I, I remember that there's more pushback now, right? Yeah, I, uh, I know I grew up kind of in a Christian Lutheran bubble up, up through my senior year of high school. And then, uh, went to college at a public high or public college and, uh, you know, honors program where ideas and the world of ideas, not just from the Bible, obviously those might be entertained maybe. Um, but that was big. And so I, I had a lot of anxiety about like, wow, I, I can't just take for granted that everybody sees things the way I do. And I think, you know, that was, you know, 16 years ago, and it's just progressed even further, you know, people say we live in a post Christian culture, which kind of means, you know, most people have heard about Jesus in contrast to a pre Christian culture, but they already have their minds made up about him and they can give you a 1000 reasons why it's a bunch of baloney or maybe what you believe about Jesus isn't the real Jesus and, and there's just a lot of a lot of pushback so I think that's um, something that everybody faces. Um, and if you haven't faced it as a young person going away to college and becoming an adult, you're going to face it. Absolutely. And, and it's a challenging thing, especially if this is some of the first uh, couple of times that your faith has actually been pushed on. Uh, it, it's there are, we take everything for granted in life. Um, and, and I don't just mean like we should be more grateful, but like, if you don't have to constantly test it, you kind of just sort of assume that it's going to be true. Like I've never really just stopped throughout the day and dropped things to check on gravity. Um, and so in the same way, it, you, you can sort of grow up with your catechism saying this is most certainly true over and over again, but if nobody's ever really come along yet, and asked, is it though, um, that first couple of times, it, it's a shocker. Um, and you, you end up looking for the word. So how do we start to respond to, uh, to that pushback, both internally and externally? Yeah, well, I, I think, uh, I think the internal is first. Um, uh, that was the thing that I realized, which gave me the most anxiety when I went to college was, it wasn't the questions other people would ask me, but it's the fact that their questions would reveal that deep down, I still had doubts. Um, going back to seventh and eighth grade, when I started reading about some different worldviews. And um, I think the internal is, is the key, because it's easy to respond when you feel comfortable. But if you don't feel comfortable and someone's questions reveals your uncertainties, that's, uh, that's a lot harder. Um, so when I think about kind of the internal, how do you respond to your own struggles? Um, especially as you get into college, I know, I mean, I mean, when I went to college and saw everybody my age going through the same thing, which was, uh, you know, you kind of grow up and your life is given to you, you know, your parents, uh, at least, uh, you know, if you have a stable home, which a lot of people don't, but, you know, in a lot of ways growing up, your, your life is given to you and you'd kind of take for granted that, well, this is the way things are. And I didn't, I didn't necessarily choose it. And it's just the way things are. But when you go away and you start living life on your own, all of a sudden you have to say, well, what do I think life is about? Not just my parents or my friends or my pastor or my professors, whatever um, ideological stripe they're of, but me, like, what do I think life is about? And there comes this point where I think, and it's healthy, it's really healthy. It can be very hard, but it's really important. And you kind of come to this crossroads where you're like, I can't just take it for granted because someone else said so. I need to know for me. And I think, uh, 
I think there are ways that I think there are two longings that everybody has about kind of saying what is life all about. And I think they're very consistent with driving us closer in a relationship with God, but there are some lies that our culture, and I think Satan obviously is behind it. There are lies that try to suggest that these longings that we have don't have anything to do with God or our, or our faith. They're, 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 you have to find them out in the world. They're not something that you know the Bible speaks to. Uh, and the two, the two longings that I think uh, are really important have to do with truth on the one hand and meaning on the other hand, truth in terms of what's real, what mm-hmm. sources of information can I trust? Obviously, you know, and Lutherans, as Lutherans will say, you know, going back to the Reformation, you know, the word of God is, you know, the source and norm of blah, 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 blah. You know, this is the truth of the revealed word of God. Um but, you know, that that is an open question as far as our culture is concerned. In fact, it's a settled question. It's the Bible's most certainly not true. Um, and so there's this truth aspect of who, what do I trust for guidance about navigating life? And then there's a there's the meaning side, which is what makes life worth living. Like, you know, you could have a truth that's very stale and kind of bland and abstract. But, you know, at some point you have to live and you have you know, things that make life worth living, love and relationships and, and hopes and dreams. And, you know, I think the two lies that Satan can bring or our culture to detract us from bringing these things to God are on the truth side. You know, there's this idea in our culture that the Bible, faith in the Bible is blind faith. You just have to believe it. If someone comes along and is skeptical, you just have to say, well, you just need faith. And then, which is funny because I actually talked to some Mormons and I said, yeah, you know, I think I need evidence for my faith. And they said, no, you just need to have faith. And I was like, I think that's a dangerous game to play. So, you know, Mormons can say the same thing. So, um, you know, anybody can say you should just have faith. The question is, what is my faith in and uh, how do I know it's real? Um, and then on the other side, on the meaning side, there's, a, you, you can kind of go to church and feel like, you know, faith is about being forgiven so I can get to heaven. But when it comes to my real life longings that, you know, about what makes life worth living, you know, the Bible doesn't really talk about that. You know, it's more about just getting to heaven and making sure that my sins are forgiven. And I think these are very narrow views of faith. These lies try to put God in a box. And I think something that's important in navigating this process of going to college and answering for myself, what is life all about is allowing, is allowing God to be bigger than these boxes and realize, no, every aspect, every longing that he's given me both for confidence and a reliable truth and for something that's worth living that can kind of make my heart sing, you know, those are, those are God given and they're meant to be they're not absent from a relationship with him. They're not something that's like um, compartmentalized off to the side that we have to find on our own. That's a really, I mean, that's, that's a lot of really important points. And I, I mean, just to sort of pause for a minute and actually reflect upon the fact that when your beliefs are challenged, you're allowed to struggle with them internally and, and sort of get your house in order before you're supposed to like present a witness to the world, that you're actually allowed to wrestle with these things yourself, um, that, that church is supposed to be more than just sort of arbitrary Jesus points. So you walk out of the building with the exact same problems you walked in with and all the same comfort too. Um, the, the idea that, uh, other people have faith in other things and it, it should be something that's true. The idea that the Bible is true because the Bible says it's true um, isn't necessarily the best foundation for it. So if we're, we're wrestling then with, with truth and meaning and, and how these two need to intersect in our lives, that means there needs to be a true faith, but there also needs to be a, a relevant faith, a faith that, that matters and connects to, to what we're after because we have a God who actually wants to bring us comfort. And a God who won't bring us comfort is not a God who will address our everyday needs. And and a, a, a comfort that's in something that's not real is not a real comfort at all. It's just sort of a blind distraction that's going to end terribly. Like you can believe with all of your heart that you are impervious to getting hit by cars. But if you play in traffic, that's a bad false comfort. You want a real one. Uh, but you also want one that's, that's going to make you feel safe in the road.